Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrew Gordon, and on behalf of the Program on US-Japan Relations at Harvard and the Reichauer Institute of Japanese Studies at Harvard, the co-hosts for today's event, I am delighted to welcome you all for this uh, special panel, Japan's 2011 Disasters 10-Year Anniversary Reflections. We have a, a wonderful um, lineup of presenters and I wanna to move to them as quickly as possible. I do first want to make one comment about a strange irony that today I just realized this morning is not only the 10th anniversary of the 2011 disasters, well, something I've been well aware of for, my, for quite a long time. It's also the first anniversary of the declaration of a global pandemic which happened on March 11th last spring 2020. So going forward forever, these two events will have a strange uh, anniversary link. I also want to very briefly um, point you to an event that will be happening this evening, also concerning the Great East Japan Earthquake and Tsunami uh, organized by an organization or a, a, the Tohoku University's um, Disaster Studies uh, Center, IRIDIS, which is emerged as Harvard's strongest partner in Japan in various aspects of thinking about the March 11th disaster. And it's uh, you, you see the information on the board. APRU is the Asia Pacific Rim University uh, Consortium. And uh, we'll send out a chat if any of you are interested. This will be done in English uh, with an audience aimed at Asian Pacific Rim countries, uh, but anybody is welcome. I also want to now observe a moment of silence in honor of, in memory of the victims of the March 11th disaster. So I'm going to stop my video and Let's um, observe a moment of silence. All right, thank you very much. Now let me introduce our three panelists. I'll introduce all of them up front at the start, and then we will move in the order that you see on the poster uh, from one to the other to the other. And we should have a good amount of time for questions at the end and discussion. All th it's a wonderful lineup for two reasons. One, the depth and the importance of the work these three presenters have done in the last decade about the March 11th disaster in Japan, and also their close connections to Harvard, to Japanese studies at Harvard. Uh, Daniel Aldrich, who is now the, a professor and the director at Northeastern University of the Security and Resilience Studies Program, uh, completed his PhD at Harvard in uh, 2005, an MA before that. And he was a postdoctoral fellow with this program on US-Japan relations in 2006, 2007. He, the connections of his research to disasters in general, to nuclear issues, goes back some time from his doctoral dissertation and first book, looking at arguments over the siting of um, nuclear facilities in a comparative context, to the fact that he had a personal encounter with disaster having started his employment at his first postgraduate job at Tulane University, just I believe weeks or a month before Hurricane Katrina forced him and his family on a moment's notice to evacuate from New Orleans. 
And so he was already well acquainted with disaster and focused on thinking about it as a phenomenon, as a, as a scholar. Uh, and has done important work on the topic uh, ever since. Most recently, in 2019, he published a book, Black Wave, How Networks and Governance Shaped Japan's 311 Disasters. And that book has been recognized uh, with an award from the Japan NPO Research Association for Outstanding Book. Our next presenter will be Hiroko Kumaki, uh, Dr. Hiroko Kumaki who uh, just recently received her PhD uh, from the University of Chicago in the anthropology program there in 2020. Hiroko's connection to Harvard goes back to her undergraduate days and the connection of, to the disaster is likewise profound. And to me also, because it was three days after the disaster that I first met Hiroko. She was finishing, or she had just finished on March 10th, an undergraduate um, honors thesis focused on archeology, span I believe. I had stayed up all night, several nights in a row to hand it in on March 10th, fell asleep, woke up, the disaster had happened. Her parents live in Ishinomaki, uh, which was very hard hit by the disaster. And for some time she was unable to reach them. Fortunately, they were fine. And in that context, Hiroko came forward to be a key figure the, in organizing and leading an organization, an organization called Harvard for Japan in the immediate aftermath of the disaster. And she's gone on to become an anthropologist who studies disaster and mental health issues related to it. Her PhD dissertation title was Reasonably Exposed, Politics and Ethics of Living Fukushima. And her, her talk today will uh, pick up on those themes. Our third panelist, Ryo Morimoto, is an assistant professor in the anthropology department at Princeton University. And he too, during his PhD studies at Brandeis, became closely connected to us at Harvard and to me and to the pro project creating a disaster archive, the Japan Disaster Digital Archive at the Reichauer Institute of Japanese Studies. He served as a postdoctoral fellow and a manager of that project for three years from 2016 to 2018. And we worked very closely together. And it's a pleasure to welcome him back uh, to this event. His dissertation focused on living with living in the shadow of the nuclear disaster, doing field work in the uh, affected zones in Fukushima prefecture. And he's preparing a book to be built out of his dissertation, The Nuclear Ghost, Atomic Livelihood in Fukushima's Gray Zone. So th those are our three presenters. I'm really looking forward to hearing from each of them. And so let's now turn things over to Daniel. Oh, first, I'm sorry, a quick note about today's seminar procedure or etiquettes. You are welcome at any time to submit questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And the session is recorded, but only the panelists' video and audio will be recorded. And please do not make your own videos or photos, screenshots, etc. All right, let's get going. <laughs> Zoom problems. <laughs> Thank you so much to the program, Mr. Panda Relations, uh, to Shin Fujihira, to Andrew Gordon, and the staff. I tremendously appreciate being invited today, and this is really an important conversation to have. I wanted to talk about today. Actually, sorry, before I begin, I wanted to put my email address and my Twitter handle out there. If people in the audience have questions that we don't have time for today, I'm happy to answer those questions later uh, via direct conversations. So I want to talk about today uh, actually three puzzles that have been on, on my mind for the last decade, actually, uh, in thinking about what happened on uh, this date, uh, March the 11th, uh, 2011, uh, up in Tohoku. And we all know the tremendous tragedies that we saw there, the huge number of individuals that were killed uh, and people whose bodies are still missing today. What we're interesting to think about as well though is in fact, if you look at this graph in front of you and this lays out the densities 
of villages, towns, and cities along Tohoku's coast, uh, along with the proportions of residents who were missing or dead in those areas. It's a little grim, but if you look at the really good news here is for a number of the communities along the coast, there were no casualties. That's a really fantastic thing to see. Uh, this has been one of the most significant disasters in recent history, uh, in re actually in human memory, really for the three disasters happening simultaneously. And to see that we have such a big number of cities with no casualties is a good thing. Of course, the bad news at the same time is some communities in Tohoku, uh, in fact, lost 10% of the population or higher. That's one puzzle I'd like to talk about today. Also talk a little bit today about the recovery processes. Uh, we know, of course, that not every community in Tohoku is recovering at the same space or the same time. I put up nine communities here from Namie and Fukushima, Minami Soma, Ofunato, Yuzen Takada, and you see really big differences even in the first two or three years after the tsunami. Uh, in terms of how quickly they're able to be rebuild things like critical infrastructure, roads, schools, uh, and so forth. I want to talk about, about recovery. And then finally, a little bit about mental health. I know my colleagues were talking about these in more length, but a little bit about the patterns that we've seen and maybe why we've seen those patterns. These are six different functions that we've seen, uh, especially from evacuees from Fukushima. Uh, the top two horizontally are, are pretty good outcomes. We call them resistance and resilience. The middle two are not as great, meaning the consequences have been a long term and the bottom two unfortunately involve things like PTSD or uh, unable to enable to work. So uh, in the time that I have, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think we should be talking about things like social ties and social infrastructure. Uh, and this image brings together the theory uh, that we've had from uh, experts like Bob Putnam there at Harvard about the three types of connections that we all have, bonding, bridging, and linking ties. Bonding social ties are those that connect us people who are quite similar. So people from the same school, the same background. Uh, bridging ties go beyond those racial, ethnic, class uh, configurations to meet someone perhaps through work who's different or maybe through a club. And then finally, linking ties go across a power gradient where bonding and bridging are horizontal ties, linking ties are, are vertical ones. And I'm gonna to argue today that all three types of those ties are critical elements in thinking about what's been happening in Tohoku uh, since March the 11th. And these four images kind of bring those together, the theories of social ties. The first two on the left are exit and voice. Of course, Albert Hirsch Hirschman said a very long time ago that we all have choices as consumers. The same thing goes after a major shock like the 311 disasters. Uh, every person along the coast who got out of that alive had to make a decision about going back to a damaged home, a damaged business, a damaged community, and investing time, energy, psychological costs in rebuilding. We'd call that voice or choosing to relocate and move someplace else. And I'm sure we'll talk about this later, hopefully during our session, about the larger out-migration uh, that's been going on for quite some time from Tohoku generally and most of Japan's periphery. But certainly this set of disasters has sped that up. We also see a few people moving back. And there's articles recently from, for example, from New York Times and other places talking about some entrepreneurs and people who have gone back deliberately. But that very first decision about exit or voice, do you stay and work? Would you go someplace else? I would argue is strongly influenced by a sense of place, a sense of belonging, and local ties. Individuals who feel that they have those things going on are more likely to stay and work. Individuals with weaker ties would probably leave. We saw also an image there of, of the small fish eating the big fish. That, of course, is collective action. Many of the challenges present uh, during and after Tohoku require people to work together collectively where social ties were stronger, where trust was higher, easier to overcome those barriers to collective action. And the final image is mutual aid or informal insurance. We know that when you've built up relationships before a shock, much easier to draw in them during the shock. Um, so just really quickly talking about the idea of mortality that I mentioned earlier, a number of different theories, especially from Japanese scholars, but even from observers, about why some towns saw such high levels of casualties, others saw low ones. We have demographics, for example, the height of the tsunami. We have things like physical infrastructure keeping us safe. We have political in involvement, and we have perhaps this idea as well of social ties. And in many of the interviews that I did for that book, Black Wave, that Andrew Gordon very kindly mentioned, uh, in that book, uh, of the hundreds of people that we spoke to, most of the elderly people who survived got out through the assistance of neighbors, friends, and kin. That is, they had both mutual aid and informal uh, assistance helping them with collective action. They were stuck in their homes when wheelchairs or relatively immobile, didn't have time in the 40 minutes between the earthquake and the arrival of the tsunami to move. Uh, but in fact, what we saw was that those communities with higher levels of trust, higher levels of connections were able to move faster. 
we did graph uh, and, and try to measure, for example, did tsunami height have anything to do with outcomes? And the simple reality is no, not very much. You see Tanohata, uh, for example, all the way on the right, very, very high tsunami, relatively low casualties, Onagawa, Rikuzendakara, Utsuchi in the middle there, relatively uh, moderate tsunami, Rifunatori Yamamoto again on the left. So again, you see communities here not having mortality rates tied directly to things like the height of the tsunami, um, but rather I would argue from our data that it's really about social ties. And we measured these in different ways. For example, Kominkan, uh, we measured Chonaikai membership and participation. We measured things like crime rates, all kinds of different variables. But one finding that we found were in this first stage of survival, having stronger networks was a really critical element of what's going on. Next, thinking about the recovery process. Uh, how has it been in the last 10 years? Of course, uh, if you've traveled in the area, and I, I encourage you if you haven't been there recently, uh, these, some of these villages and sounds and cities look brand new, and some of them literally are brand new because the entire downtowns were destroyed. The areas right near the docks or the wharfs have been rebuilt completely. Ishinomaki was cleaned up, as we can see here. Uh, this next image comes from outside Sendai. So a lot of obvious reconstruction, debris being picked up, things being cleaned up. Uh, but the simple reality is that, that those aspects of recovery are tied to a number of other factors. And one of the most curious uh, cases of recovery that I saw was a place I'm gonna call Coastal City. And this was a community on the coast uh, that I visited pretty early on after the disaster. And they began with this massive earth moving process. Uh, this is not a bridge. This is actually a large scale earth mover. It's a conveyor belt. It's conveying the crushed up mountains from the left side of the image down about a mile or so, two kilometers to the downtown area to literally lift up the downtown. Now it's around 14 meters above where it used to be. So this coastal city uh, had a $225 million construction project there within three and a half years of the tsunami. And then if you look at the overall spending they put out, it's over $3 billion. These are well beyond the budgets of any local community outside Tokyo, certainly, and certainly outside a village of 16,000, which was the, the population before the tsunami hit. So in doing interviews in Coastal City and a number of other villages, it became quite clear one of the reasons they were able to get this project and other communities that also wanted to rebuild did not get this project were because of vertical ties between members of the mayor's committee in this coastal city and members of the cabinet especially the Fukocho, the, uh, the reconstruction agency. So that, that vision, that, that visit that I had was backed up by data that we found on the processes of recovery across about 50 different communities. There, those communities with strong vertical ties, areas able to plug in to Tokyo's assistance, wealth, uh, use of Kokyo Jigo, these large scale projects, they were the ones that we built afterwards. Uh, final set of discussions would roll ro around mental health. And of course, we're all familiar within, the, within uh, March uh, the 13th and 14th, as it became clear that Fukushima Daiichi had three meltdowns ongoing. Uh, communities that we see in this image from Naraha in the south, uh, all up to Minami Soma in the north had to evacuate. Uh, some of them evacuated a little bit later, uh, and, and some of them, of course, are still out. If you visited Futaba, uh, it is still very much a ghost town. In fact, I watched the news this morning, 3% of Futaba at this point has, has been allowed to return. 97% of the population has not yet returned. So we see uh, huge numbers, 145,000 people at the height had to evacuate from th these communities alone in Fukushima because of potential exposure to radiation. And it's, it's pretty obvious uh, that along with suffering through a huge earthquake and a tsunami, then to have to go through a radioactive evacuation will cause various high levels of mental stress or anxiety. And we measured these using a relatively straightforward process called the Kessler-6 or K6 scores. We ask very straightforward questions. Over the past month, how, af how often have you had trouble falling asleep? Or over the past month, how often have you felt worthless or depressed? And with that information, we could compare Futaba, which had the nuclear event, and the tsunami, and the earthquake, to Ishinomaki and Yamada. And you see here the highest levels of stress and anxiety were measured only in Futaba, where roughly half of the people that we talked to, of the 800 people we surveyed, uh, told us that they had that level of stress uh, compared to Ishinomaki, that's only around 5%, Yamada around 6%. So in these communities, Futaba uh, evacuees have been uh, dealing with a lot of stress. We initially envisioned that perhaps uh, the process would be re revolving around issues like income and health, those in fact did not have a measurable impact on these kind of uh, K6 scores. Uh, rather, the only thing that really were the ties to neighbors. Going through this shock with people nearby, knowing there are people going through this kind of event really helped reduce uh, the stress and anxiety of those communities. So just to wrap up, 
Uh, I've tried to argue today that over the past decade, we've been able to observe uh, the outcomes from this tragedy. And one of the good signs was that communities that had built up stronger horizontal and vertical ties before the shock tended to do much better during and after that shock. We saw that in the survival process, in the recovery process, and in the mental health as well. But the, the corollary, which is now, uh, if you know Gavin McCormick, a pretty old argument in our field of studying Japan, is that Japan is heavily overinvested in physical infrastructure, to which I mean $250 billion have gone into seawalls. According to our data, at least, those seawalls did not reduce mortality rates in any way. Uh, unlike, let's say, things like having stronger trust, more kominkan, and more interaction, those social infrastructure aspects really, really did. So I would just encourage us to think through uh, more broadly, what are we thinking about disaster? To what degree do we recognize the role of social capital? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh... Daniel, and now we'll turn to Hiroko Kumaki. Hey, thank you, Dr. Andy Gordon, for the kind introduction earlier. Um, I'd like to thank the Weatherhead Center for US-Japan Relations and the Rice Shower Institute for organizing this important panel. Um, a special thank you goes to Dr. Shinji Fujihira for all the communications organizing work, and to Stacy Matsumoto, um, Amy Stockton, uh, Emma Sachi Duncan, and many others working behind the scenes today. Um, thank you also to the audience for being here today. I recognize um, some of my friends and colleagues from the Harvard for Japan initiatives um, in the audience, and I'm honored to be invited back and to continue this conversation that began uh, a decade ago in the final months of my time in the college. So today I'll be talking about mental health care after the 311 disaster. And um, I think this really ties in well with what um, Dr. Eldridge just discussed about social capital. Um, as Dr. Gordon mentioned, I am an anthropologist and I have been carrying out ethnographic field work, mainly in Miyagi and Fukushima prefectures after the 311 disaster. My project, uh, current project examines a broader negotiation around health and well-being after 311 uh, with a particular focus on the nuclear fallout. But my initial interest in disaster mental health care has been formative for this broader project. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be able to focus on this topic today. In Japan, in the recent few decades, mental health care has been referred to as kokoro no kea, or care for the heart. And I'll be using this term kokoro no kea instead of disaster mental health in this presentation because it kind of helps me capture the work that kokoro no kea is doing beyond um, medical and psychiatric frameworks of care. In the wake of the 311 disaster, kokoro no kea was everywhere in discourse and practice. But every time I participated in discussion among Kokoro no Kea practitioners, there was almost always a debate over what exactly was meant by it. And I soon learned that this elusiveness of Kokoro no Kea was actually its, its strength in disaster response. The indeterminacy allowed divergent actors and resources to be organized around Kokoro no Kea, often in ways that filled in the gaps of mainstream disaster response that, as Dr. Aldridge mentioned, um, centered really on material and economic recovery, as well as compensation. The goal of this presentation um, today is to elucidate some of this gap and the negotiations around health and well-being that took place from within the gap. So in the time I have, I will give a general overview of Kokoro no Kea as disaster response in Japan, before discussing an example of his activities in coastal Fukushima after 311. The 1995 Kobe earthquake is often identified as the major occasion in which Kokoro no Kea emerged as a recognized part of disaster response in Japan. In the wake of the earthquake, a robust network of psychiatrists in Kobe City responded by introducing the concept of trauma in consultation with US disaster responders and established Kokoro no Kea centers to implement Kokoro no Kea as long-term disaster response. 
And I'm showing us on the slide, the image is around um, a TV drama that was recently broadcasted in Japan based on this, this experience in the 25th anniversary of the Kobe earthquake. In addition to trauma from earlier on, there was an emphasis on moral support and on not leaving anyone behind in the uneven recovery process. The experience in Kobe became a model for Kokoro no Kea for large scale disasters in Japan thereafter. So in the wake of the 311 disaster, upon the mandate of the central government, Kokoro no Kea teams were assembled across Japan by universities, medical associations, and hospitals. These teams consisted of a combination of psychiatrists, public health nurses, social workers, clinical psychologists, administrative staff members, and so on. This was before Kokoro no Kea teams became an official part of disaster response in 2013 as disaster psychiatric assistant teams, or DPAT. So the responses uh, to 311 took place on a relatively ad hoc basis. Starting with the Kokoro no Kea teams, around, uh, after around a year, Kokoro no Kea centers were launched across Iwate, Miyagi, and Fukushima prefectures to provide long-term support to the affected communities. And I'm showing on the map the current locations of Kokoro no Kea centers. Like the Kokoro no Kea teams, Kokoro no Kea center also consisted of a multidisciplinary team of healthcare practitioners. And it's important to note here that many other areas outside of these prefectures were also heavily affected by the disaster and also became a place of evacuation. So there were many other actors providing Kokoro no Kea outside of this more officialized framework that I'll be discussing. So Kokoro no Kea as a general disaster response includes Kokoro no Kea practitioners going out into the communities visiting shelters and homes, holding tea sessions, exercise sessions, and other social gatherings with the aim of preventing social isolation, isolated deaths, suicide, trauma, depression, alcoholism, dementia, and so on and so forth. As I discussed later, they also carried out public facing activities to communicate the effects of the disaster to policymakers and to the general public. In addition, for 311, there was also Kokoro no Kea in response to the nuclear fallout. Fukushima's prefectural health survey has emphasized mental health effects due to frequent and long-term evacuation, concerns for radiation and its health consequences, as well as stigma and discrimination. Clinical psychologists have also been part of risk communication, working with risk communicators and residents in responding to the risk of radiation. Kokoro no Kea practitioners have also been an important support for evacuees scattered across Japan, where governmental Kokoro no Kea framework often did not reach. So depending on the resources and the characteristics of each disaster in each area, really diverse activities took place as Kokoro no Kea. And this is just to frame the example that I'll be discussing in the following slides as embedded in this more complex web of Kokoro no Kea after 311. So I'll now turn to an example of Kokoro no Kea in, this, in coastal Fukushima in the so-called Soso region, uh, the red area um, on the map that have been affected by the earthquake, tsunami and nuclear disaster. And a uh, part of the area has also been designated and still remains as the evacuation zone. In the wake of the nuclear disaster, those working at psychiatric hospitals first had to evacuate their patients to hospitals across Japan, often on tourist buses that were sent to the area. As hospitals had to close down due to evacuation, many of them lost their jobs thereafter. And some of them subsequently volunteered at an emergency psychiatric clinic established in a city right outside the evacuation zone or became part of the Kokoro no Kea teams organized by Fukushima Medical University. While many of the disaster affected areas had Kokoro no Kea teams come from outside their region, Fukushima had to mobilize its own resources because teams from outside refrained from entering the area due to the nuclear fallout. In the initial phase, the emergency clinic provided access to medicine and care for existing patients, 
and the Kokoro no Kiya teams went around the shelters to check in on the mental health conditions of evacuees. In addition, in this region, mental health care practitioners responded to the vacuum in mental health care by establishing a mental health clinic and a Kokoro no Kiya center on their own without waiting for the government to do so. In the following years, they further established other facilities for those with mental and developmental difficulties who are often more vulnerable to the effects of the disaster. The network of support also extended beyond those with diagnosed conditions to provide a more comprehensive care to the communities at large. So the Kokoro no Kiya Center I worked with carried out various activities that we might not necessarily consider as mental health care. Just to give you some examples, on my first day at the Kokoro no Kiya Center, I joined the staff members who were visiting a home in an area where evacuation order had just been lifted. In an isolated part of the town, a man lived with his son in his late 20s, who had been retreating to his room for over a decade since before the disaster. He evacuated and returned under his blanket. The staff members had been visiting the home to check in on them. On the day we visited, they had a conversation with the father, took vitals of his son by sticking their hands under the blanket and talked to him without expecting any response. Later that day, I joined a group of young adults to plant vegetables and planters. These young adults in their 20s and 30s had returned to their communities after evacuation. However, they had not been able to find a job and were out of touch with society. The staff members told me that had it not been for the nuclear disaster, these young adults could have found a job in the community through informal networks such as their home businesses, neighbors, and subcontractors of, of industries in the area. This includes the nuclear industry. As these resources were no longer available, the Kokoro no Kiya Center gave them a place to practice their social skills, make friends, and eventually find a job. As my first day already indicated, one of the major concerns of Kokoro no Kiya in Fukushima and elsewhere has been the breakdown of social safety net due to the destruction of communities by evacuation, as well as multiple divides created in the aftermath, um, particularly in Fukushima around the decision to evacuate and the differences in compensation. So creating opportunities to reshape these ties and carving out a place of belonging for people, memories, and their psychological injuries were an important part of Kokoro no Kea activities. For example, during my field work, staff members at the Kokoro no Kiya Center were making a recipe booklet of local flavors, festivals, and sceneries that community members had lost access to in the wake of the disaster. And you're seeing here a few pages of the recipe booklets. They interviewed elderly residents, compiled recipes, and held cooking events where community members could come together across generations and across various divides to share these familiar dishes. By handing down and cultivating shared memories in the community, the staff members hoped to create ties among community members and cultivate a sense of pride in their place of living. Those who were part of Kokoro no Kea also took up public facing activities to elucidate the chronic effects of the disaster that was often difficult to make visible and knowable immaterial or more statistical terms. What you're seeing here are some of the books that those engaged in Kokoro no Kiya have written as part of their public facing efforts. And every year around 311, you'll see these authors and many other Kokoro no Kiya practitioners appear on the mass media to discuss the effects of the disaster. For the nuclear disaster, you'll often hear discussions of complex grief and complex trauma, denoting chronic psychological effects as well as discussions of ambiguous loss, which sheds light on the difficulty of grief work when people loses their hometown due to evacuation, but when that hometown still physically exists. High numbers of disaster-related suicides and other forms of death among those who experienced the nuclear disaster have also been highlighted, along with the plight of municipal workers who had been the target of residents' anger and frustration. 
So in sum, Kokoro no Kea has filled in the gaps of disaster response by building mental health care capacity in the communities, reestablishing communal ties and social safety nets, as well as making the chronic effects of the disaster knowable to the world outside. This requires an enormous burden and flexibility among Kokoro no Kea practitioners who need to become a kind of jack of all trades and deal with aspects that the existing system is unable or unwilling to deal with. As such, Kokoro no Kea practitioners are well aware of the limits to what they can do. However, their activities become an important vantage from which to elucidate the uneven effects of the disaster and to reconsider the kinds of recovery that is taking place and futures that are put in place that often leave certain groups of people, their ways of life and their, their injured hearts behind. In the Soso region, I often heard community members say that it takes at least 70 years to build a community from scratch. 10 years is just a small step and some who still awaits return to their hometown have not been able to take that first step. A public health working in the Soso region once mentioned, we were all forced out of this community. We don't want to exclude anyone again. Kokoro no Kea centers usually close down after their designated time in the area, but the center that I worked with was actually preparing to stay, to see through the 70 years and beyond with the goal of making a community that did not leave anyone behind. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Hiroko, for a really uh, important presentation. And now we'll turn to Dio Morimoto. Okay, sorry. I thought I was not muted. Okay, well, thank you so much, Professor Gordon, for your kind introduction. And of course, thanks to our program in US Japan Relations and Reicher Institute for making this event possible. I'm very grateful to be back here and I'm be engaging with our great colleagues uh, who presented earlier. My assignment today is on the nuclear issues and I was rather broad. So I wanted to approach this using two wins in Fukushima. Oops. Sorry. The first one is Fuhil. The term stands for rumor of bad reputation. And the general and persistent imagination is that people and things in Fukushima are contaminated. Fukushima products suffered and are suffering despite its rigorous testing and monitoring regime and over 99% of the tested samples were found to be not contaminated in 2020. This is one example of how people outside of Fukushima imagine the region and its people. According to the survey done by the Mitsubishi Research Institute between 2017 and 2020, over 40% of Tokyo residents believe that there will be some adverse health effects from radiation exposure among Fukushima residents data on the left. On the right, over 40% of them believe there will be some negative effects in future generations of Fukushima from the accident. The second one is hookah, the term that stands for a process of disintegration, fading, or forgetting. What fuka here means is not forgetting about a key or a wallet, but about the triple disasters. In the 10th year, residents concerned that people, including themselves, are already beginning to forget about 311. And caught between the two winds, the unique challenge for Fukushima is this. For Fukushima to truly reconstruct, Fuhio needs to be undone, but this could risk making the accent and ongoing issues to be forgotten or become less significant because contamination is primarily what Fukushima is known for. So today I'll talk about um, 10 years in numbers and an ongoing challenges in Fukushima and in some case examples from the field. 
to make a suggestion about you know, how to navigate between these two winds in Fukushima. And I want to mention that I created a JDA collection for this um, presentation. And you can go to this particular collection to explore further each items I mentioned. So here's a map of Fukushima Prefecture. The map you see has only the image of the power plant and the tsunami since that's about what most of us know about Fukushima. So let me provide some data to fill this map. Fukushima is the third largest prefecture in Japan next to Hokkaido and Iwate. The size is close to the Connecticut in the US. There are 1.8 million people, over 1.8 million people in Fukushima. Fukushima lost about um, 1,600 people, over 1,600 people, 196 people still missing, and they lost over 2,000 people from uh, evacuation, what they call disaster related deaths. There are 118 cases of suicide and 179 cases of confirmed thyroid cancer. Number of evacuees originally was uh, over 160,000. Its peak in 2012 has been reduced to 36,000 or over, and most of them live outside of Fukushima currently. A number of people residing in the former evacuation zones that have been reopened are over 14,000 people, and then 50, over 50,000 people are still registered. And the number of temporary housing units in Fukushima has been reduced to 12 in the last 10 years. Because of the pandemic this year, Fukushima Prefecture prepared a virtual commemoration site where you can go to offer virtual flower and a message to the 311 victims. And I highly encourage you to do so by visiting this site and you can see other people's messages there as well. So what happened um, since March, 2011? As for the environmental contamination, the total 570 petaduct backrolls of contaminants reduced, and it's about one tenth of the Chernobyl accident. And some went into the marine environment and the others in the ter territorial environment. Important point to uh, mention here is that most of the contaminants fell onto the forest and less so in the urban residential areas. And as a result of this, and then to address this issue, in 2012, the national government um, multi-billion dollar decontamination project started and has enabled gradual reopening of evacuation zones, reducing the size of zones from 12% to 25 in 2020. And according to the government, um, decontamination can reduce around 30 to 50% of ambient radiation levels in residential areas and of course, you know, there is a different data available in the green piece. So, you know, you can go check it out. And as a result of the contamination, there are 90 million bags of decontaminated waste throughout Fukushima in its peak. And you probably remember seeing a lot of images of these black bags. But now those bags are disappearing. All the decontaminated waste is being sent to the interim waste storage facility in Hutaba and Okuma town, towns that host the damaged TEPCO nuclear power plant. As of today, there are about 380 temporary waste storage sites left, and about 75% of all the decontaminated waste in Fukushima has been shipped. And I want to mention that this facility's size is about four times larger than the Central Park in New York. So, you know, the waste is supposed to be moved out of Fukushima in 2045, 30 years after the first bag of decontaminated waste was delivered to the facility. But the question is, would they? 
And then this is just for your information, but there is an interesting site where you can visit and see the real time movements of decontaminated waste transportation vehicle. So, you know, you, you can just see where things are and which bags are mo being moved from where. And now let me briefly talk about Japan's nuclear power since March 2011. Japan is still under the nuclear emergency situation declared on March 11th, 2011 at 4.36 p.m. Japan Standard Time. Nuclear gen energy generation went down from 25% in 2010 to 6% in 2020 and 24 out of 54 reactors is scheduled to be decommissioned. And then nine reactors are currently in operation and then they're all in the Western part of Japan. The public opinions um, no longer support nuclear energy. However, the latest governmental strategic plan in 2018 aims for nuclear power share of 20 to 22% by 2030 the goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. And climate change is of course a big factor here for the government and the policymakers to push for nuclear energy. And the same is true in many other countries. But the Japan's case shows like how difficult it is to decontaminate or decommission. Around 4,000 workers are working today on to decommission the damaged power plant. And then recently, 566 spent fuel assemblies at the reactor three was removed. And you can see in the picture, that's the reactor three and then Professor Gordon is observing. This um, means there are a little bit over thousand assemblies left between reactor two and reactor one. However, the main issue is the melted core debris of over 880 tons and nobody knows how to get to it. According to TAPCO, they optimistically schedule that decommissioning of the plant to take about 30 to 40 years. However, the global pandemic has slowed down the process, not because uh, there are many cases in Japan or in coastal Fukushima, but because um, you know, the cases in Britain stop the uh, creation of the robotic arm, which was supposed to help uh, probe in the, the fuel um, debris. Another issue is many TEPCO employees now are hired after March 11th. So we have to think about how to keep them motivated to engage with this issue. And February 13th aftershock post issue to the damage plant and it's a huge risk factor. Now, um, of course, there's this issue, all of you are aware of, of the contaminated water, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but it's expected to be full in fall 2022, and a big discussion around reducing this contaminated water into the ocean. And this obviously relates to the Fuhio issue I mentioned earlier. Now I want to share one story of how residents of coastal Fukushima are trying to live despite all these issues. A group of organic farmers in the Kashima district in Minamisoma, the city which fell under partial evacuation order is using organic indigo farming and dyeing to rebuild the sense of community and connection to the land that was severed by the 2011 accent. Why indigo? Because it's not something people consume, so there's no concern about Fuhio. But also, it has become a way to get reconnected to the soil, which become contaminated because of the accent, and regain a sense of confidence in the place they live. Why organic? This is what they said. A natural process is important because the nuclear accident showed that relying on advanced technology for efficiency while ignoring its negative aspect can lead to bad consequences. As you can see in the picture, most of the members are old. 
an aging society issue is a big problem in coastal Fukushima. In there, on average, over one in every three residents are 65 years or older. But here, it's important to note that people are not just passively suffering. Also, it's important to note that the effect of radiation has not been in the um, you know, disintegrations of uh, DNA and molecular issues, but disintegrations of social ties as uh, Professor Aldrich mentioned. And in cases in this area, help us to ask what people are doing to recover those severed ties. Another story I want to share is the history of a US-Japan radiation of the Iwaki airfield in Okuma town. And there's this um, commemorative stone tablet. It says, the U.S. air raid of the Futaba district on August 9 and 10th, 1945, which targeted the Iwaki airfield where kamikaze pilots are being trained. After the war, the field was reappropriated by the national government and it went to the Tsumi Seibu group and then to Tapco. Why is this tablet important? This memorial tablet shows that Fukushima should not just be a moniker for radiological contamination nor nuclear accident. The accidents help us to reflect on nuclear energy's broader social and historical structuring of inequality. Also, the tablet's location by the contaminated water tanks illustrates the importance for locals to protect their lands from the government and a private company to use and abuse them. And this story helps us to understand why many residents stayed or wants to come back despite the risk. To conclude, I have some suggestion for navigating Fukushima to wins wisely. First, let's start calling the so-called Fukushima nuclear accident, the TAPCO accident to make it clear that the Tokyo Electric Power Company Holdings is responsible for the accident in coastal Fukushima. Second, let's be critical of Fukushima stories that do not specify location within Fukushima or focus only on sufferings. Those residents, as I described, who remain in the region have been trying to live their lives. And we need more stories of how people live in despite the ongoing challenges. And finally, let's visit Fukushima and experience it yourself and fill your map of Fukushima with rich histories and cultures instead of letting the technical accent erase and overwrite them. And as Professor Gordon can tell, there are many tourist things happening in the area, both of the dark and the hopeful kind. So I do encourage you to think about visiting Fukushima after the pandemic is over. And here's just a one suggestion of how you can fill up your map of Fukushima. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ryo. And I want to thank all of you for all three of you for really rich and valuable presentations. And I want to turn now to, and I also want to thank all of you for keeping precisely to the minute to your time uh, allocations, which is rare in an event like this. And so we have a good 30 plus minutes for uh, discussion. Uh, I'm going to start with a question that I would have wanted to ask uh, myself and my colleague Ian Miller asked it um, for me, uh, and it brings in the historian's perspective. So I suppose in a way I should ask it and then answer it, but I won't. I'll ask it and then turn it over to the panelists. Um, his question, he says, is unsurprisingly a history question. He's my colleague in the history department who works on Japan. 
he wonders how the three of you would situate the 311 events in a longer and deeper dynamic of Japan's modern or longer history. And uh, he observes that in much discussion, not necessarily today, but in much discussion of the disaster, um, the implication is either that March 11th was something new and unprecedented, especially perhaps with a focus on the nuclear accident, or else it's likened to a disaster such as World War II as a moment of, of Japanese suffering. And neither is wrong, but he's curious to know how any of you would situate the dynamics of what you've studied or observed within a longer historical uh, framework of uh, disasters in Japanese history. And so I, I would turn that question over to anybody in the, uh, among the three panelists who wishes to uh, answer it in any way. I'm happy to start. I think that's a, a great question. You know, I would actually put Fukushima in line with other past nuclear disasters, which simply haven't received the coverage uh, because of the scale that they were at. But Tokaimura, for example, uh, a city out uh, not so far from Tokyo actually had an accident which uh, killed two workers, a criticality accident there. Uh, there was a manju sodium spill that was covered up uh, by its operator. And then uh, we've also had a series of scandals in industry when cracks and damages to various plants have not been reported as they're supposed to have been reported. So in, in my mind, the culpability and the outcome are not a new process here in Japan's nuclear industry. Uh, this is part of a broader institutional challenge of separating out a highly controlled set of regulators uh, who move regularly between TEPCO uh, the LDP and the bureaucracy, that iron triangle, which still exists, at least in the Genshiro Kamura, at least in the nuclear uh, village, I believe there is still very much a long-term institutional challenge for us. Great, thanks. Either Joe or Hiroko want to take us? Yeah, I'd be happy this? to jump in here. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so I'll speak a little bit more about um, perhaps like how people are experiencing, we're talking about it. Um, I guess in the Sosa region where I did my field work. Um, when I'm outside of the Sosa region, I often hear the story of uh, Fukushima being kind of um, wrapped up in a nuclear history, uh, like Dr. Eldridge mentioned, as well as you know tied to the Chernobyl, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Um, but in the Sosa region, um, especially because I had a lot of chance to talk with elders um, in the Kokoro no Kia uh, uh, activities, um, I encountered a lot of stories of immigration and uh, particularly immigrations, uh, pre-war, but also post-war immigrations. Um, so for example, an area, Namie is part of the, uh, like right now, now outside the evacuation zone, but right north of the nuclear power plant, um, they had a timber industry going on. And then when that closed, had to close down, then there was a lot of immigration to Brazil. And so I had um, people tell me about the, you know, the evacuation is kind of another movement of people um, or within you know, the, the history. Um, so it's evacuation is another movement that they were kind of forced into because of, of the, the, you know, in their involvement in the national project. So I just wanted to um, put that also into the, uh, I guess, the discussion. That's fascinating. I hadn't had any idea of that type of sort of self-consciousness of, of that historical link. That's really interesting. Uh, Yo, any thoughts? Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, I was somewhat expected this question. Therefore, I put this, <laughs> you know, the story of the Kamikaze pilots and all that. But I think I want to follow up on what Dr. Kumaki mentioned about the story of uh, migrations and migrations, you know, within that area, you know, we can also look into the Tenmei famines and then early 19th century, which brought a lot of, um, you know, social residents from the um, Toyama and then Hokuriku regions, you know, and then that's another argument for why they have a strong attachment to the land they live, and then despite the contamination, they're not willing to let that go. Uh, another thing I want to mention that, you know, um, something that I've been looking a lot is the connection to uh, a lot of uh, indigenous communities uh, throughout the world who also been victimized by the, um, you know, the fallout 
you know, from the weapon contestants and why not. And I, you know, I noticed that, that a lot of stories and narratives is similar to the kind of suffering they experience. So I'm kind of wondering here, you know, what are other ways uh, to think about Hokushima than say connecting to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which had a you know very different kind of exposure. Yeah, thanks. That's really interesting. You know, my own uh, sort of self-reflection as a historian is that I had not sufficiently understood until March 11th, 2011, 2011, the profound heritage of disaster, warning of disaster, responding to disaster in Japan. And I had written a textbook which had an astonishingly small amount of reference to earthquake and zero reference to tsunami. Um, and so I had to revise it and rethink the context in which um, March 11th happened and the existence. But it's a complicated story because on the one hand, you have the existence of markers going back even a millennium um, along the coast. And then you have, and this connects to Joe's point about Fuka or forgetting, you have the forgetting of those lessons. So, but that I do think gives some responsibility to historians and others to keep, well, it's difficult. I mean, remembering without stigmatizing, that's sort of the point of Rio's talk. And I think it's, it's really important. So thanks for that question to Ian. I wanna to turn to a question from Neil Denton, who's uh, joining us from across the other ocean, that is say the Atlantic from Durham, UK, where he's a professor of practice and uh, risk and hazard and risk and resilience. This is mo most, I think, for you, Daniel, although the others could jump in, he's, he writes that he's struck by the differential impact on outcomes due to differing levels of the pre-existing trust, connectivity, and capital. And he, and you'll have to unpack the, these terms from Daniel, but has there been any exploration to the differences between transactional versus relational models of recovery and their respective efficacy? Wow. Uh, yeah, so those are terms that I haven't used as much. If I remember correctly, relational is more the long-term connections people have, and transactional are more, let's say, short-term interactions uh, that are based on re reciprocity. Uh, those are really interesting ways of seeing it. You know, my own perspective has definitely been influenced um, more by the recognition of the different types of power and verticality versus horizontality. Um, there has been some work done on this idea that especially people who survived the shock felt the need to give back. And there's some really interesting work, for example, uh, by psychologists in the Kokoro no Kea, we heard from Daku Kumaki, uh, in places like Ibasho, uh, which are, in a sense, uh, locally run physical community centers where people gather for all kinds of reasons. And in doing interviews there, people often said, I had so much help from other people, I felt I had to do something for people in my own community. And these were survivors themselves who had been through these tremendous shocks, lost homes and lo loved ones and their jobs. And I, I think there is definitely an aspect that uh, when you go through a shock, you definitely feel a bit of a change. You feel some kind of obligation to give back to people nearby. And actually, I think we heard a, I heard a story yesterday in the class that I teach uh, from a woman who moved from Tokyo to Kobe in 1996, actually, uh, with a desire to give back there after her, her practice. So I think that there are aspects of this, but I'm, I'm more interested in this question of uh, to what degree are these ties horizontal in the community uh, and ongoing or vertical between locals and people outside the area. Thank you. I want to pick up on this question and before moving to the next one, turn this issue that Daniel put forward about the tremendous importance of networks and social connections to pose to each of the other presenters to Hiroko Kumaki and Morimoto. In your own work, Hiroko, you spoke, of course, about connections among the people who were receiving the Kokoro no Kea. Did you have a sense that the did you have a sense of differential success in dealing with these challenges of living in the wake of the disaster that did reflect the vibrancy or the depth or density of their earlier social connections and conversely ways in which the project you were involved in helped to generate those connections? Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a very great question. Um, one thing I could say is that in terms of the, the people providing care, um, one thing that they mentioned a lot is that the existing ties and connections that they had before the disaster really helped in organizing and get, garnering kind of support from within but also outside of their communities. Um, and of course, um, 
communities or the ties within the communities before the disaster is, uh, is very important as Dr. Aldrich mentioned, because people who will be, be helping you in the, acute, in the immediate aftermath will be your neighbors and your families as Dr. Aldrich mentioned. But also um, in the, I guess, once everyone's in the shelters and then they're going into the um, temporary houses, this is a lesson from COVID, but when people are not moved into temporary houses, as, as a community, then um, the ties will be, you know, they, it's very hard to make new ties in the temporary houses. And so communities who are able to move into the temporary houses and then eventually the public housing together um, had a much better, I would say, like, um, well, social ties that in, in the community of support. Um, and so in that sense, um, there's a, there was a lot more support uh, for corona care practitioners going into uh, temporary houses and public housings where that was not possible, where communities were not able to go in together. Um, so there's a lot of that intervention as well. Yes, th th thank you. And, and Joe, how about for you, the, the, the community, in your last example in particular, the second to last example about the indigo, um, I mean, there's there's a case where a group of people are able to come together. Uh, the, the being dispersed in the case of many in Fukushima, of course, it makes the maintenance of any existing social network so much harder. Uh, but did did you observe the kind of sort of general picture that Daniel presented in your own fieldwork? Yes, uh, I think, you know, our, you know, social network is fundamental, you know, for people to have this sense of, you know, connections and why not. But I also observed in the case of uh, Minamisoma, which was uh, divided, um, you know, five different um, places that sometimes they haven't, you know, social capital was uh, damaging in the sense that, you know, we lost all this connection and then didn't know what to do about it. So for example, um, you, know, the, you know, we didn't talk much about it today, but the compensation for the disaster really made the difference uh, clear between the residents, right? Some residents received certain amount because of the location of their house while others didn't. And that kind of thing sort of, uh, divided people, you know, across different scales. And, you know, in the Fukushima, I think one of the key word is um, bundan or bundatsu of the communities. Um, so, you know, I think to me, what's important is, again, like what, you know, what do people do when, you know, the existing or pre-existing social ties got severed and what are the kind of things it takes for them to try to recover those ties, right? Whether to the people or to, to the land or to the um, local and the national government. So, you know, to me, I think this question about social capital is important for that sense as well. Thank you, thank you. Uh, a, a number of questions have just popped in, so I wanna move along and hopefully we'll have time to address most of them. Uh, Hiroko, a question for you from James Godley. Are the practices of Kokoro no Kea organized around the necessities of care? And, and that is, is the basic framework or conceptual organization of Kokoro no Kea oriented toward an aim or a particular goal of healing? And are there metrics that are used to measure that success? Yeah, thank you for the question, Jamie. Um, Yes, this is a really great question. Um, Kokoro no Kea is generally oriented towards prevention. And so this is something that's very interesting about Kokoro no Kea centers. Um, and this relates to the difficulties Kokoro no Kea centers often have when they first enter the community because they are built after the fact with the kind of assumption that there will be a need, a long-term need. And oftentimes they go into the communities as a new organization. And so they have to find a place of Kind of belonging within the communities and see what needs there are and what roles they can play. And so, um, as I kind of mentioned, it's a very, they have to be very flexible. Um, and what they do is very diverse depending on where they're, uh, where they're at and who's carrying it out. And again, this is, a, this is carried out by multidisciplinary um, kind of healthcare practitioners. Um, and so it's, and it's also oriented towards things that you can't really measure. And you know, having to measure really requires 
a certain set of, um, you know, you have to look at people who have symptoms or focus on people who um, are able to become statistics. Whereas a lot of the times, coconut care practitioners are dealing with the gap of with people who are not necessarily diagnosed with any conditions, who are not really sick, but they're they're obviously not doing well um, socially and, and maybe physically too. Um, and so this is a really good question. Um, there are probably there are a lot of metrics like the Kasich scales that um, Dr. Eldridge mentioned to actually measure if you know the rate of depression and so on and so forth. But in terms of um, whether they can actually show that oh they've been so successful, uh, not necessarily the case. But that's a, that's why it's very difficult for them to really show that this is something that's important to continue doing. Great, thanks a lot. One very quick follow-on question, uh, Hiroko, from uh, Patricia Bottomley. Is there is there a group similar to Kokoro no Kea operating in this country that you're aware of? I'm actually not too, uh, um, I actually don't know, but I, I know that um, you know, Kokoro no Kea was based on the responses to the 1989 um, San Francisco earthquake and the 1994 Los Angeles earthquake. And that was the basis for the um, Kokoro no Kea in, um, in Kobe. So uh, I believe that there are a lot of um, things that the Japan has brought in from the US. I'm not sure if anything like Kokoro no Kea Center or Kokoro no Kea teams um, are mobilized um, in the way that it does in Japan. Thanks. I'm going to jump around a bit. I'm going to, I'll, let me pull two comments or two questions together that are related and then ask um, variously uh, whichever ones if you want to uh, respond to them. One from Ryosuke Nangase, who saw a lot of nonprofits going to MPOs working in Tohoku on reconstruction variously. And he's interested in an assessment of their role and how they've collaborated either with local governments, central governments, or not it, or other stakeholders. It's a gigantic question, uh, of course. And so I don't expect a complete answer, but if somebody wants to give a, 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 a quick version. And, and somewhat relatedly from Tim George, uh, how do we account, it, it, it's related in the sense of connection between localities and their activities and the government. And it, it connects to what Daniel mentioned as coastal city. Um, how do we account for huge differences in place to place in the funds? Well These are great questions from Roske and Tim. Um, Roske's question, I think uh, this disaster, unlike let's say Kobe or before, in, in many ways, Kobe was sort of year one of large scale volunteering, which meant that certainly Kobe itself didn't have the, the capacity to handle the number of volunteers who came down. And as we all know from the work of people like um, uh, Robert Peckin and other people have written about this, there've been huge changes to the law and regulations to allow more NGOs to be involved, to register. And I think I saw that a lot at doing interviews along Tohoku's coast, uh, along a num number of NGOs involved now that weren't involved in past disasters. That, that's a really good thing. But it's, at some level, though, uh, this is because the central, local, regional governments have very st specific areas of work that they do, very much siloed off from other, other things, so that in many ways, like the work of Kokoro no Kea, that had to begin functioning, even though there was not yet, let's say, funding officially from the government. Uh, the work that I've done with Ibasho, that funding was completely from outside Japan. There was no funding locally for those kind of NGOs. So I think in some degree, those NGOs had to get involved because there was such a gap between the kind of official assistance given from the, the central region and local governments to the towns for these large scale hakamono uh, unwanted projects, which ties in Tim George's question. Uh, I would say coastal city, based on my research, uh, literally had one, let's call them an, an obikai, a, a, a network of old boys. Uh, one of them was a member of the, the mayor's office in coastal city, whose friend was working in the cabinet office. Uh, and that connection was enough to make a single phone call to begin over $3 billion in aid, which didn't go to other communities that also had a small population and large damage. So I, I would stick by the argument that vertical ties are critical, um, but that NGOs are filling in the gaps in the policy uh, areas. Thanks, and, and um, we'll, we'll delete from the, the record the identity of Coastal City. But for either Ryo or Hiroko, your sense of, well, I mean, Kokoro Kea is an MPO, right? And, and so are some of the groups, I suppose, the Indigo group as well. So I, I guess your answer is they were 
really, really important. Maybe I can sort of frame that question in connection to the really astonishing to me statistic that Daniel gave about the amount of money spent on seawalls versus the amount of money that might have been spent on promoting the type of local organizational networking activity. From your perspectives on the ground, would you have seen or do you still see um, ways in which funds from the center could uh, help the kind of activities that Kokorno Kea, for instance, engages in or that you, know, you observed locally in uh, Fukushima? Yeah, so I can kind of start. Uh, so, in, you know, the funding obviously can be, you know, reallocated and then distributed elsewhere. But at the same time, you know, um, especially 10 years after uh, many of the uh, residents and coastal Fukushima and other parts of uh, coastal areas, I believe, are not necessarily happy about the idea of always depending on the money coming from elsewhere. So this sense of independence is, you know, becoming more and more important. But at the same time, you know, I will say like it's always necessary to have people coming from outside, you know, as you know, in Japan, like we say after the disaster, all you need is outsiders and the young people, and I wouldn't say idiot, but the reckless people who want to challenge stuff, right? So I think, you know, people are needed not necessary money. So like, I guess the money should support people coming from outside to be able to do stuff. Thank you. Uh, Shigeru, our colleague at MIT has a question, Shigeru Miyagawa about seawalls. Um, and he writes that he believes he's seen a museum in Sendai. I'm not familiar with it, the tsunami of the 311 magnitude happen every 400 years. That sounds about right, but then the seawalls maybe will last 50 years. And, I mean, implicitly, Dan, you were casting doubt on the value of the seawalls, or maybe explicitly, uh, but uh, is it basically, I guess this is a question for anyone, any one of the three of you, um, is, was there, has there been any really good purpose served by this investment in seawalls, I guess is the gist of Shigeru Miyawa's question. I mean, I'm a, a vocal critic of these overinvestments in physical infrastructure. I'll just give three quick reasons why and maybe a solution. One is that these seawalls actually often decrease people's need or feelings of evacuation. People that we interviewed that were trapped by the water who didn't leave often said they had felt safer living behind a seawall and that they didn't think they needed to go because they had this 15 meter seawall, which had in some cases bankrupted whole communities. Why bother evacuating if you have that? That's sort of the moral hazard. The second is people actually couldn't see the hazard. And this was really a problem in Kano and elsewhere, where people actually literally walked on top of the seawalls to be able to see down because they could not see where the tsunami was. And they were of course killed uh, when the tsunami came over. Uh, and, and the third reason is, of course, it damages coastal ecosystems. Uh, you know, most of these have huge bases. If you've, if you've been in the area, right, to have a 15 meter tall seawall, you need around 30 to 40 meters wide of concrete. So what you're destroying is an entire football field of local life and displacing that for as long as that seawall is there. And of course, you're also changing the wave patterns of erosion. So uh, people I've talked to, Peter Matanle has a great piece on this. I think it was called Imagining Disasters in the, in the Era of Climate Change, where he basically argues none of these seawalls actually mention things like rising seas or, or broader climate change. All of them are ad hoc, right, to the, the one single shock of this process. Um, I, I think it's really good work as well. Um, I can't remember now the name of the Japanese anthropologist who embedded in the communities who fought against the idea of building seawalls. And that name will come to me probably in about an hour. But anyway, he embedded in, in local communities and found that some of them stopped plans to build seawalls because of local activism. And I would say that's what we need to see. Communities arguing that there are other ways to protect themselves from these uh, rather than building these concrete monstrosities. Yes, it strikes me that there's a kind of natural experiment underway, although it will last for a very, very long time to observe the outcome since, as you say, Daniel, some communities have pushed back. So not everybody has built a gigantic seawall. Not every coastal town has built a gigantic seawall. So over years and decades, it will be possible to observe um, the ways in which that decision has played out compared to places that adopted different strategies. 
And that's, I think, a kind of ongoing learning that can be done. Uh, I want to, this is also a, a, a Fukushima related question. I think um, perhaps, Ryo, you might want to take a first step at it from David Brown. Has the impact of the nuclear accident overshadowed the impact of the tsunami devastation and loss of life outside of the Fukushima coastal region? And is there a, I mean, and I'll just throw in my sense that that may even be more powerful as a, as a, with an answer of yes, outside of Japan, and maybe less so inside of Japan. But how did those living along the coastal areas, but not in the nuclear disaster zone, feel about this differential attention? Yeah, well, thank you so much for that question. And I think that's a very important one, because when we talk about um, this uh, nuclear accident or the Fukushima in general, we only focus on that. And I forget to mention about the tsunami. And as I mentioned, uh, many people um, died as a result of it. And, you know, the divide I was talking earlier has a lot to do with a different kind of losses that residents experienced in that area, right? Some, of, some people didn't experience the tsunami at all, you know, other than that they saw the uh, devastations while others um, basically directly affected by it. And then now imagine those two different kinds of victims were being put in the same temporary housing unit, you know? and then negotiate like what the 311 was about, you know, it, that's a very difficult thing. And I think, you know, you know, the tension still remains uh, for sure, but, you know, I would say that the victims of the tsunami, some have moved on already uh, from this, uh, you know, unless they're coming from, you know, the, the former evacuation zones. But I think, you know, we, really need to um, emphasize and remember that, you know, the tsunami was what led to the accident and then all the other aftermath. So, you know, we always uh, should talk about, you know, the story starts with this earthquake and tsunami. Yeah, it's really a challenging issue. I f f felt in going to Tohoku and especially at the disaster center in Sendai, that there are really two disasters that don't necessarily speak to each other in Japan. And that uh, it's, it, it's, uh, that situation is really a challenging one. Uh, Perhaps I could jump in a little bit here, um, just to add a little bit about on the mental aspect because we're, uh, I was looking at more of people who have been perhaps left behind on this. Um, there were still some um, people saying that they would want to talk about the tsunami, but because the nuclear is the focus, um, they haven't been able to, and that has been um, a source of their long-term distress. Um, there's another aspect that um, part of it, what Dr. Morimoto mentioned, was that um, people were put in uh, different uh, temporary, not temporary houses, but public housing, depending on whether they were affected by the tsunami or whether they were affected by the nuclear disaster. And those who were in the area who that was affected by the nuclear disaster um, within the evacuation zone, but were affected by the tsunami were put it in a different um, temp uh, 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 public housing. And so there was a very different uh, scheme of compensation and support for the two as well. And so that really um, intensified the debate that uh, Dr. Morimoto was talking about. Thanks. You know, we've only got time for maybe a couple questions. One more, and there are several who are, uh, well, there's far more, four or five that I haven't been able to pose. So no more time. We do have a log of those questions and we'll share them with the panelists who can variously reply, I hope. Um, from outside of the normal suspects of our community, somebody who I know very well because we share parents. Um, I think it's the first time she's ever observed a, a venture at the Reichau Institute. Uh, but my sister has a question for Hiroko. Is there hesitancy of people to express their mental health conditions coming forward? And did Kokoro Care have a particular strategy for overcoming that? That is a wonderful question. Um, 
since Kobe, there's been a little bit of a lower hurdle for Kokoama care practitioners, but there was still um, stigma towards seeking help in, in the manner of more like talking to psychiatrists and so on and so forth. So when people, were, uh, the Kokoama care practitioners went into the shelters, they deliberately did not put on a name tag or asked not to put on a name tag that says Kokoama care. And, um, and Kokoama care center, uh, of practitioners that I was working with also made sure that they dressed like the community members and really just um, was there as a community member rather than a caregiver. And so there were a lot of maneuvers around that. Um, one good strategy that they used was to bring a, an equipment to measure blood pressure uh, because that's more um, accepted in Japan. And so they, they would measure people's blood pressure and talk to them and see how they're doing. So yeah, there's that's a very good question. There is still some stigma left. That's that's a brilliant strategy. We've we've only really got questions. I'm going to choose the maybe the simplest question to answer of the four or five we haven't addressed, so that there there will be time. Um, and that comes to Rio from, from Gavin Whitelaw about, um, and it relates to your point, Rio, about naming. And you wish that this wasn't called the Fukushima um, meltdown, but the, or disaster, but the TEPCO disaster. And, and Gavin asks why this Indico project was branded Japan Blue and not Minami Soma Blue or something more local. And uh, maybe they weren't listening to your advice, but can you give, um, or Fukushima Blue, I suppose, would have been then especially con contrary to your advice, but was there a reason that had to do with the fact that the seed was not local or do you know anything about that? Um, I think that probably comes from more of the subconscious sort of the feeling of like, you know, self-deprecation, right? Don't want to emphasize the locality because even though this is the way to sort of go around the food fuel issue because it's not a food, but at the same time, they're aware how they're imagined by the outsider. So they don't necessarily want to announce that this is coming from Minamisoma. But I think, you know, uh, what would be of interest of, um, you know, Gavin would be that, you know, there now a connection to the um, Tokushima regions, you know, with the indigo stuff. So this, this new way is creating a different kind of social network that didn't exist before. Thank you. That's really interesting. Well, we've come to the end of our time and I want to thank everybody. I think we had about 160 um, participants at the peak um, as you are all speaking, which is fantastic. And uh, I'm delighted to have had all three of you return virtually anyway to Harvard and join us and maybe next year in person. Um, but um, this has really been a, a valuable and wonderful session. And, and thanks to all of you. Thanks to the audience. And um, we will try to ha have some answers go out to those of you that couldn't get addressed uh, during our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much.